Hi, my name is Mark Reed, and I want to share with you how you can start to achieve more impact from your research in less time. To do that, I want to get your thinking straight on impact, and I want to share a couple of tools that can really help. Like you, I'm a full-time, busy academic. I don't have the time I would love to achieve impact. I have to squeeze it in the gaps between my tasks during the day. And that means I need to think strategically about impact. So the most common question I get is, Mark, I want to achieve impact. Where on earth do I start? And a common misconception is, well, obviously, Mark, I should start with a big idea. If I can just have a big enough idea, that's what will change the world. And of course, having a big idea is important. We will come to that. But that's not where I start. So if that's not where you start, then, well, maybe I start with an impact plan. Sounds like a great idea, but no, that's not where I'm going to start. We'll come to that next. But first, we need to know who are the people out there beyond the academy who ultimately might benefit from our research. Who are these people who seem even vaguely to be interested in what you're doing? Go and talk to them, find out why they are interested. Uh, try and get underneath people's skin. Because ultimately what we're trying to do in this very first step towards impact is to deeply understand the change we could achieve in the world. And I think the mistake we make is that we build our ivory towers uh, coming up with these grand ideas uh, that we throw out from the top windows of these towers. Uh, and the reality is it's a scattergun approach. I'm wasting time doing things that were never going to work. If I'd just spoken to one or two people, they would have told me that it wouldn't work. And of course, some of those ideas uh, inadvertently squash a few bus passers by. We get negative unintended consequences, cons consequences because we just haven't fully understood the context in which we are working beyond the academy. And so instead, let's climb down the stairs of our ivory towers. If we can, let's not even build them in the first place and start talking to these people out there who are interested in our work, who might have needs. And as we speak to them, we take this step of empathy. We start to see ourselves and our research through their eyes. I start to see the kind of challenges they're facing, their lived realities. And now I can choose that one thing that would really resonate, that would meet a felt need, that would really make a difference. And what little time I've got, however I can arrange my research, I bend it towards trying to do that one thing. And as a result, this is that one thing that might actually really work and deliver real world benefit. And of course, at the same time, I've built all these relationships with people. Uh, and as I've been talking to people beyond the academy, I discover I'm not alone. There are other people who want to see the same change. And some of those organisations may have staff time, resources. Uh, they are trying to mobilise to make this thing happen. And so I can now work with them. Uh, my evidence now powers what they are doing. And impact becomes a team sport. Uh, what I could have done with the tiny amount of time I had was always going to be quite limited. But now, in collaboration with these people, in service of this one impact goal that would really make a difference, there's a real chance that what limited time I have is going to make a real difference. Now, I'm going to train you in this very short video uh, in this empathic approach. And if we want to take an empathic approach, which is what the evidence suggests works, our starting point must be those people beyond the academy, uh, the organisations, the people, the groups that might ultimately benefit, not our intellect, our big brains, our, our idea, uh, not even an impact plan. Uh, let's go and speak to some people, have some conversations. Now, what actually is impact? I've used this word benefit already, and I want to suggest that a very simple way of understanding impact simply is as benefit. Uh, for a lot of people, this is uh, the, you know, the one word definition that clarifies everything. 
So just pause for a moment and ask yourself, what are the benefits I can see from my research? And that is your impact. If you can't see any benefit, it means that you haven't got any impact yet. You need to keep pushing that engagement or whatever it is that you're doing until you can see that there are benefits. But for many of us, we just have never asked the question, uh, who are the people who have benefited? Have there been any benefits? And when we start asking the question, we see, oh, so that's the impact. But equally, very often when we ask this question, who benefits from our research, we discover that it's not just the people who benefit, there are people who perhaps are harmed by, uh, who are disadvantaged by, who are not happy for whatever reason about what we thought was going to be a benefit. And so the definition that I've used in my book, The Research Impact Handbook, is that impact is the good we as researchers do in the world. And let's just be clear about this. We are talking about the good we can do outside the academy. If this is uh, benefits for me, for my career, for my research team, for my discipline, uh, then that's academic benefit. We might measure that in citations and such like. We're not talking about that. We're talking here about non-academic benefit. And I've used this word good on purpose to emphasise that this is a value judgment. My good could be your bad. And what might be good for one group in one time in one context could be very different, could be harmful, could be disadvantageous to even the same group in a very different time or context. And so there is this subjectivity that is inherent in our ideas of impact, which is why uh, in this, which is the first uh, cross-disciplinary peer-reviewed definition of impact, we've used this word perceptible. Because demonstrable, hmm, to whom? For what purpose? Against which set of values? Yeah, perception matters. Impact is very often in the eye of the beholder. Now, this is important because one of the biggest challenges uh, that I see as I train is confusion about what actually is impact. A lot of us instinctively feel like, well, yeah, of course, I get it. I know what impact is. But in reality, there is a willingness. And in particular, the problem is when you are a bit woolly about the difference between engagement and impact. And if you're not quite sure where your engagement stops and your impact starts, then you have the potential to write grant proposals, which you think are all about impact, but in fact, you've just got a whole lot of engagement objectives. Uh, and when you're writing up your impact, writing a, a case study, for example, uh, there's a danger that you may end up writing again about the pathway, the dissemination, and not actually the impact, and you miss the point. I was on a, a grant panel for one of the, the, the UK's funders a couple of years ago now. I was on it twice. And the last time I was on it, it was impact fellowships. And around 50% of these impact fellowships did not have a single impact objective. And those proposals were instantly unfundable. If impact is a key selection criteria for your funder, then you need to make sure that you have written impact objectives, not engagement objectives. Um, I look at my paper with uh, Bella Reichard uh, et al, and uh, you'll see our analysis of high versus low scoring ref impact case studies. And it's exactly the same problem there. Uh, the low scoring ones were much more likely to talk about their pathway, their engagement, their dissemination, and not the impact. And so these are all very clever people. Uh, the grant, grant proposals, uh, the, the case studies have gone through layers of pre-review and everyone seems to have missed this distinction. And this is a fatal mistake uh, in either of those two contexts. So we need to get this right. So what am I talking about here? Well, the, probably the two most common disasters that I see are people who come to me with incredible public engagement and impressive policy engagement that they're convinced is actually impact. But it doesn't actually matter how many millions of people I've reached on uh, social media, how many YouTube views I've got. Maybe uh, I, I've been on the news. Maybe someone's even made a documentary about my research. Maybe I'm famous. Fantastic. For all I know, that is all just hot air. Uh, perhaps nobody listened, nobody understood. Uh, I spoke in so much jargon it went over everyone's head. Maybe in fact I just offended millions of people. I don't know until I go and at least can talk to a sample of those people and find out if any of them benefited in some way. And at minimum, I would hope that, uh, that, that some of those people have understood something important that they didn't understand before. And I can argue that that is beneficial. <clears throat> 
Equally, I have people who come to me with long lists of policy briefs. Uh, I've been to, uh, we've given webinars and seminars, we've done one-to-one -one meetings, we've been invited to give evidence to inquiries and committees, and some of that's been written up uh, in, in committee reports. Yeah, that's impact, surely, isn't it? I mean, look how much time I've spent doing this stuff for it. And I have to break the news to these poor people that actually, great, really good engagement, keep up the great work, and maybe ultimately you get impact. But all I see at the moment is the engagement. I want to know that someone somewhere has benefited. And again, at minimum, the people who read my policy brief, came to my webinars, listened to my evidence, have understood something important that they didn't understand before. And in the policy setting, as in a public engagement setting as well, uh, I, I clearly want to know what happens next. And yeah, it's an impact that people understand something. It's a weak impact. I want to know that uh, that understanding now has led to something even more beneficial, something perhaps that I've done that has benefited me or others. And in a policy setting, that would be there's some kind of change in policy or guidelines or regulation. Uh, and that in turn now has ideally in time led to some kind of public good. So let's get this clear in our head. And for me, that word benefit is the easiest way of keeping this clear because the point at which my uh, engagement, whatever that is, has benefited someone, that's the point at which I've got an impact. And that's what I need to hold on to uh, and aim for and keep sight of. Now, I wonder if you're understanding this. Um, a lot of people come into a talk like this thinking, yeah, I get it, Mark, I understand what impact is. And we're uh, over halfway through and you still are talking about what impact is. But it's because so many of us get confused. And let's just see, are you actually confused or do you understand this yet? Uh, can you answer this question? So it's on the screen, six different types of impact. And I'm going to suggest that one of these by definition, if you accept my definition of impact as a good or a benefit, one of these is not an impact. Can you spot the one that should not be in the list? Is it an economic impact? I've made money, I've saved money. An environmental impact, I've protected the environment, I've enhanced it. A social impact, perhaps uh, it's uh, social policy, education reform, I've closed an attainment gap between boys and girls. Uh, it's a technological impact. I've got an idea that might change the world and I've patented it. A health and well-being impact. People are healthier or protected from ill health or harm. Or a cultural impact. Um, for example, uh, we uh, understand spiritual benefits from nature uh, that are coming as a result of some kind of intervention in nature. Which of these is not an impact? Well, uh, a lot of people will answer economic, environmental, social, uh, health and well-being, uh, recognising that there are trade-offs. And of course, it's a fair point. Uh, I can uh, achieve something that makes millions of pounds and also kills millions of people or creates some kind of environmental disaster. And we need to be aware of that. People also quite often vote for cultural when I give them this choice. Partly because, well, how on earth do you measure that? Uh, in one project that, uh, that I co-led, we uh, asked that question. How we got a divinity professor, a philosopher, an economist, and we were able to come up with answers uh, that uh, could evaluate the spiritual benefits people got from nature. But the other point people make at this point is, well, yeah, but can't that then have other benefits? So if I'm having spiritual benefits from nature, maybe that's going to enhance my well-being. Maybe that then enhances my health. And yes, I can see that. And I would agree. And it's important to also think about these co-benefits. So great. I'm doing something for the environment. But actually, uh, this thing that I'm doing to reduce greenhouse gas emissions is also reducing energy use, which is actually saving people money. Um, I and maybe there's some social benefits, and let's try and capture them all. Uh, wonderful. Uh, so we can get quite complex about this, uh, but I can still argue that each of these, uh, in and of themselves, are beneficial. Where I struggle is to argue that a technology is, in and of itself, a benefit. And, uh, and so, great, I've got an idea that might change the world, but it's only when that idea 
now has been put into a bunch of people's hands and they're using it and actually getting benefits from it that I can see that it's making them healthier, it's saving them money or whatever else it might be. And so the technology is in that same category as engagement. It's the mechanism, the pathway, the thing that gets you to impact, but not the impact itself. And um, look through any patent office um, uh, book and you will see patents. Great, uh, you've got it patented, but there are so many crazy ideas that I'm very glad nobody ever made. <laughs> and we can probably all think of technologies that were created for a good cause, but have in fact been used to kill, maim and destroy. So great, you've got a technology. Fantastic, you've patented it. But I want to know, what is the benefit of this? And only at that point do I know I've got an impact. Now, on screen now, I'm going to give you my full typology, 10 different types of impact. And on the right hand side, you can see the ones that we've just looked at. All of these are long term. Various different studies come up with different answers, but most of these are in the decades to go from research all the way to the most impressive impact on the right hand side of this chart is going to take you a long time. And that's a problem because if you are someone from outside the academy who comes to a researcher looking for help, next year is already too late. I'm uh, looking for something kind of now, actually. Uh, and in a decade, well, I might be retired. I might not even be alive at that point. That's a problem. And I think this is particularly problematic given so many of us now doing co-productive research where I'm asking people to come along on this journey with me. They're giving of their time and of their energy, often for free. And what do they get back? Very little, at least in the short term, and it can feel quite extractive from their perspective. So we need to think of things that can give back. And so on the left hand side of the screen, we can see uh, things like understanding and awareness, as I've described, uh, capacity building. Uh, if this is something that I can do something with, great. So let's do some training. Uh, let's uh, turn our open access um, uh, paper into some open access data, turn that data into a database, uh, turn the database into a decision tree or a decision support system. Now, yeah, I've got a nice paper, but I can also use this data to do things for myself. Uh, perhaps I'm connecting people with, uh, with resources, with other people, expertise. That means I can now do things I couldn't do before. Perhaps my training has given people skills. Uh, perhaps uh, as a result uh, of uh, an information briefing, uh, people just understand things or a lot of public engagement. Great, we've done that, but we can see that we have changed people's awareness levels. Perhaps that transformed people's attitudes. Perhaps that in turn changed people's behaviours. Perhaps some of those behaviours were decisions. Some of those decisions were policies, guidelines and the like. Uh, and perhaps some of that then led to these longer term things. And so my plea to you is to ask yourself, what could I do now on the left hand side of this? How could I turn some of the stuff I do with my students into some kind of CPD course for professionals? Maybe I can even make some money out of that for my research group. What could I do that I would intrinsically love to do that I could do easily that would give back? And uh, as we do this, we realise that, in fact, yeah, I, I want this to ultimately be based on my own research. But whether or not I finished my research, I can achieve impact now based on other people's research. I think it's really important to call out the delaying tactics that a lot of people say, which is, well, I'm early career. Uh, I, I'm just doing my PhD. Um, we haven't finished our study yet. We can't do impact yet. And my message is you can do impact now and you can do it in an evidence-based way based on existing evidence. You can do your own evidence synthesis even, add even more value to this. We all stand on the shoulders of giants. We've got that there often in our own head. We are on that cutting edge. So let's use that to build our policy briefs, uh, uh, the public engagement work, our training or whatever else it might be that we want to do to make that difference. It doesn't have to attribute to our research yet. And as we do so, we build our own skills and confidence. We build social capital. We build value for the people that we are working with and we give back. And yes, ultimately, uh, we want to be able to do impact based on our own research. But by that time, we've built the networks. We've got the confidence, the skills. We hit the ground running and incredible things happen. 
I also want to call out this idea that reach is what we're aiming for, because I think very often we look at other people's impact. We go to, uh, say, the Ref Impact case study uh, database, and it's just so impressive. Really? Could I do something like this? Yeah, me? <laughs> it might be my PhD? Well, actually, yes. Uh, you can start because actually the reach is not the key thing, it's significance. And as a PhD student, if you have written a literature review and you understand everything in that literature review, you can start now based on that literature review as you do your research and start small. Start with one person, one organisation, one context, one community, whatever it may be that feels achievable to you and make sure it works. And if it doesn't work, we adapt until we've got evidence that there is real benefit. Now we know we've got impact. Yeah, it's at small scale, but because it works, now we can look for reach. And actually those pathways to reach become self-evident. And we often have people knocking on our door saying, hey, I've seen what you've done for them. That was really impressive. Can I get some of that as well? But ultimately, I want to take us back to the heart of this. I've alluded to this. I started at this point, and this is uh, where I'm going to finish before I give you your two tools. Uh, in a metaphor and in a word. So I went to London South Bank with a colleague a few years ago, and we held up a sign which simply read, smile. And we grinned at random passers-by. And we did this to illustrate a metaphor, which is that good ideas spread like an infectious smile. They spread through the warmth of human connection. And it is this empathic or relational approach that works. And so if you read my impact handbook, you'll see five chapters that map onto these five principles that explain how you can take this empathic approach in a very practical way. But ultimately, all of the lines of evidence come back again and again to this core concept, empathy. This is my daughter wearing my shoes in my front garden. Uh, this is ultimately about putting yourself in the shoes of those people who might one day benefit from your work or use your work to benefit others. Some people say, well, you're either born with this or not, Mark. Um, and yeah, it's harder for some of us than it is for others. But I argue this is a skill and it's a skill we can all get better at. And that's why the first of the two tools I'm going to give you is a tool which is designed to enable you to analyse who out there might be relevant for you to start engaging with. You can see much more in my book and in my peer-reviewed articles uh, where I write about this uh, as a tool known as stakeholder analysis. As you'll see from my blog and podcast, I'm now questioning that word and, uh, and using different words. Uh, but ultimately, this is what I'm calling a three eyes analysis. Who out there, even if vaguely, might be interested in your work or not? I'll come back to that. Of those people who might have influence, either to facilitate or to block my impact or not. Again, I'll come back to that. And then finally, who is going to be directly impacted by this, either positively or negatively? And why? And what comes out of this? Uh, are many things, but two groups in particular, the high interest, high influence, high impact groups who I need to reach out to. They may or may not be knocking on my door, but I need to go and knock on their door and introduce myself to them because they are the people who may well have the, uh, the networks, uh, the social capital, uh, the, uh, the resources, the staff time to uh, enable me to achieve incredible things. And working with them together as a team, we can do way more than I could ever do myself. But equally, though, we have these people who are not really interested in what we're doing. Uh, they, by definition, have no influence. They are the poor, the oppressed and the marginalised. And yet they may be more impacted, either positively or negatively, than anyone else. And it is our responsibility to work out who those people are and reach out to them as well. And so you can see this is what my tool looks like. Um, you can download this from my website. Yeah, it enables us to identify the name of an organisation, high, medium or low in terms of their interests, but then why? Which parts of the research, which parts of the organisation, uh, what are their interests? Uh, how influential? Uh, what is their level of impact, positive or negative? And again, what's going on here? Let's dig into this. Doing this myself, yeah, I might uh, be grasping at straws. Maybe there's some blanks, not sure. I go and I do an internet search. I talk to a colleague. I do a bit of uh, work to understand. 
And by the end of this, I've got a much deeper understanding of who these people are and ultimately how I might be able to reach out to them in empathic mode. And so now I'm identifying maybe just two or three organisations out of this that I think are important to reach out to. If I have time, I'll get to the rest later, but I'm not going to feel guilty about it. I am being strategic here. And now I reach out in empathic mode. So it's not in broadcast mode. Here's me. Here's my research. Let's talk. Delete. It's here's you. Here are the challenges I can see you're facing. Uh, here are the, the, the strategic objectives you're trying to achieve. Here's how we might be able to help. Can we talk? And that's what gets you a yes. And now two or three meetings later, I have a much deeper understanding of their real felt need. I see the world, my research, what we could do together through their eyes. And now, and only now, am I ready to take that next step to go from understanding who these people are and their interests and needs to an impact plan. Now, at minimum, I can do this informed by those conversations, but in an ideal world, I'm actually bringing some of these people into the process. So what does it look like? More in my book, peer-reviewed literature, and on my website. Um, and here is my template and a worked example I'll put on the screen, but the first three columns from this come from that initial three eyes analysis. And based on that now, especially I've got some extra help coming into this and doing this in workshop mode maybe, or just discussing this with a few of the people who I think might benefit, I can begin to target different activities to different groups. Um, so different activities for a minister versus an MP versus a civil servant versus some kind of frontline agency staff. Uh, and that's great. Now this is going to work much more, uh, much more effectively. I've got indicators of engagement and of impact, so I can't get confused between the two. And I know how I'm going to measure these. Uh, they're tractable. There's a specificity here uh, that helps me write better impact goals. Uh, I can see the risks. What could go wrong? How I might mitigate them? Who's going to do what and when? Do we need some resource? And as you can see, that this is not just me. My name is there because I'm in charge of impact. I'm the PI on this project. But also, I've got other people helping me. And one of these, in fact, are going to be led by uh, the organisations that we want to benefit from this. So hopefully, you've got a sense now of what you can do to achieve impact. Hopefully, you can see now how taking this empathic approach enables me to focus strategically, to work with the most important people. And now, at the end of this process, I have an impact plan that is going to work. That's not just me. I might have more impact goals than I have time to do. Great, let's focus, let's manage expectations, and uh, maybe that's a fellowship application after my PhD. Uh, maybe that's uh, another future research project that we're going to do here. Talk to my colleague, and let's now focus on one or two of these that we could really make happen, and let's do this together. And what little time I have now uh, is going to be bent towards that one or maybe two goals in collaboration with others with a clear targeted plan uh, and methods for evaluating whether or not this stuff is working and course correcting to make sure that what we do is actually going to work and deliver the kind of benefits that we hope to see from our research. If you want to find out more about all of my work on impact, including loads of free resources, then just go over to Fast Track Impact. Follow me on Twitter and get in touch anyhow you like. I would love to hear from you.